Thanks very much. It's great to be back at a GoTo conference again. Um, I'll be doing this one and Copenhagen this year, so good, good times. And um, good to meet so many old friends here as well. So this is what I'm going to talk about. Talk about culture, because this is one of the key things that changes when you go to cloud. The migration and how people migrate to cloud, in particular the way Netflix did it, and then some things about untangling the data tier, I call it the new denormal, denormalizing. That leads to monoliths, to microservices, to functions, to serverless. And then I'll end up talking about the things I'm currently working on and focusing on, which is around open source and artificial intelligence. So culture. This is, this is a nice summary of, of why culture matters. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up the people to gather wood divide the work and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. Then they'll build a better boat than the one that you had in mind. Right? So if you have people that really are committed to a purpose, they will figure out collectively how to build a better product and how to do better work than if you try to centrally control it. This, is from, this quote is directly from the Netflix culture deck. It's something that Reed Hastings uh, picked out as an example of, of why Netflix is able to do things and do things more quickly and do things better than their competition because everybody is aligning themselves to the purpose, not being told centrally what to do. However, there's quite a few other culture decks. Nordstrom has a good one. This is from Nordstrom's technology culture deck. And they boiled it down to one thing. And this is an interesting thought. Use good judgment in all situations. And this is the essence of what you want if you're trying to build a, build a culture. A lot of cultures come down to judgment. And what I, what I mean by judgment is, if you put someone in a situation and you give them enough time to think and the correct context, the information, they should make a good defensible decision. That's good judgment. That's the exercise of good judgment. But what we do in big companies and sort of traditional centrally managed companies is that we put you in a process, and your job is to follow the process. And if your job is to follow the process, then when something happens that isn't in the process, all of a sudden you're supposed to figure out how to use your judgment. But you haven't had any practice of using your judgment. And so the trick here is to not have processes, not have rules, but have everyone collectively deciding that we're going to do things roughly the same way because that is our, our collectively, we all have the same good judgment, we all have the same contacts, context, and we all have the same purpose. So if you look at some of the things that, that if you look at what Netflix is doing and the way that those cultures work and the kind of some of the ways Amazon works, what you see is what looks like processes, but they're actually artifacts of systems of people just following good judgment. So think about how judgment applies to the culture of a company when, you, when you're creating it. So the Netflix culture looks like this. It basically says that the culture itself is important. That's why values is what we value. High performance and freedom and responsibility is really the core here. That's the one that we really keep coming back to from the Netflix days. What that means is it's a trust but verify. We're going to trust everybody to do the right thing, but we're going to check that they are doing the right thing so you know that somebody is going to be watching what you're doing, so you're always holding yourself to a high standard, and that is the principle that everything works on. So that's an interesting way of doing it. Now, this culture works for a startup, for a small company, Netflix is a very homogenous company. They deliberately have only two locations in the world of any, of any size. They have a few, like, one or two scattered marketing people around the world. But they have engineering in Los Gatos, and they have content production in Beverly Hills, slightly different cultures in those two places, but extremely concentrated. Everyone in one building and everybody able to um, think about what they're doing in a very concentrated and homogenous way. But Netflix has never acquired a company. As almost a, as Netflix itself is about 20 years old. They have never acquired a company, which is crazy. Compared, if you look at all other companies acquiring companies, why doesn't Netflix? It's because they don't want to dilute the culture. 
They want to keep a very, they want to acquire the best people out of a competitor, not acquire the whole competitor and all the baggage and weird culture stuff that would come with it. So they acquire people one at a time, reprogram them to the Netflix way of thinking about it. That works for a company of a few thousand people that's grown up in the Bay Area where there's a lot of people to steal people from, right? So you spend five, 10 years at, you know, Google or Facebook or somewhere, and then Netflix seals you when you want to go and play with the, uh, you know, the, the very experienced. It's a small number of very experienced people is what they're targeting. They don't have any graduates. There's no uh, interns. There's no um, very few contractors. It's, it's basically all a very concentrated thing. So that works for that, but you can't apply this culture to a large multinational organization. So if you look at the Amazon culture, Amazon... Uh, a few months, you know, I'm trying to remember the last number, but I think last time that number I remember was 350,000 employees, right, scattered around, acquired lots of companies, scattered everywhere in the world, incredibly diverse culture. How do you put your arms around a culture like that and still have it innovate and move really quickly and be able to take on the latest things? That's these 14 principles are taught to everybody at Amazon, but they're also used as a hiring filter. If you want to go work for Amazon, you have to internalize these 14 things because the interview process tests that you, are re uh, you have got the, uh, these ideas, that you live up to these principles. And when, you go for a bo when we evaluate bonuses, they're evaluated against these principles and promotions and everything internally. So I could go to anybody that works at Amazon, any of, any of those 350,000 people, and start talking about customer obsession or dive deep or earn trust of others, and they would know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a, ga it's a gathering principle that gathers together hundreds of thousands of people into a single organization. So that is the power of having these cultural statements. So think about that, because this is what frees up the company to innovate incredibly rapidly while still having a single purpose and set of principles. And those principles are kind of the things that are typically blocking people. When I, when I talk to executives for companies that are doing the cloud migration, Tell them you have to get this culture right, otherwise you'll waste your time. You will be blocked internally by, because of you are centralizing too many decisions. And what cloud lets you do is decentralize those decisions because everything is moving so fast that you get to have the autonomy of self-service. So culture, it should be intentional, it should be appropriate, and at the bottom of all of these cultures is something to do with judgment. So think about how that applies to your own organization. If you're creating a new organization, be really careful how you create a culture. It's much harder to change a culture. So I'm going to talk a little bit about migrating to cloud and some of the lessons from the Netflix cloud journey and a bit of a few updates on this. 2008, we had a shock. We had a two-day outage where we didn't ship any DVDs. It was because IT had assumed that they could make the systems perfect and developers just had to, didn't have to think about hardware availability. Everything was just going to work. They were going to buy high-end hardware, high-end software, make it just work, and we could just implement our software over the top and just assume that the stuff underneath was going to work. Had a silent data corruption in a SAN. It just corrupted all the databases. We restored everything. It corrupted them again. And you know the whole thing was a big mess. What happened out of that? was a change of assumption. We questioned this assumption. Maybe availability had to be handled at the application level, and it had to be a concern of the developers, and we had to bring it right up there and think about it. And then, if we were doing that, could we use low-cost cloud infrastructure to go and build that, rather than this very high-end, very curated, expensive hardware? We could use off-the-shelf, low-cost, ephemeral hardware. And that was the mindset change that came through. So this was. Quite often I see when people are moving to cloud, there is a, an outage or a thing. There's some major kick in the butt that happens to management that they start questioning assumptions. So that's the beginning of a lot of cloud journeys. Added to that, there's usually an existential threat. And for, uh, for Netflix, it was that we needed a massive increase in data center capacity. We couldn't tell how much, how, where we'd need it, and we didn't have time to build it. It takes about nine months to provision a data center, and we had no idea what our capacity needs or where we were going to need it in nine months' time. And it was because streaming was replacing DVD. This is happening across industries. We're seeing systems engagement dominating IT. It used to be that IT was about looking after employees and factories. 
and maybe point of sales terminals and things like that. But you didn't have your, your IT system scaled with the number of customers or shops or factories you had. It didn't scale with the number of customers you had. Now, because our customers are directly connected to our systems, sort of whether you call it IoT or direct marketing or whatever, we know about all our customers. So now we have IT systems scaling with the number of customers you have. And that's why systems of engagement are overrunning everything else. My other favorite example is, you know, why is Netflix like BMW? People are like, why? What's he talking about? Um, BMW make cars. And it used to be that once a year you would take your car in for service and they'd probably get an update saying this car is now at this mileage and we fixed this thing and whatever. Once a year you'd get an update about a car you built. The current cars are directly connected through an AWS service back to BMW. They know exactly where they are. They are downloading map updates. They are using the car as a sensor. This thing is called Carasso. And it's a car as a sensor. They're finding out about roadworks as they're happening. They're finding out about congestion as it's happening and sharing it across their customer base. They're also collecting a lot of data about how these cars are driven. So think about how much traffic that is back into the central systems compared to seeing a car once a year scaled across all the cars you've ever built. I mean, right now, this is only in the sort of seven series and working down the range. But that's what I mean by systems of engagement dominating IT. And you can pick an industry. You can play, look at how the internet has let us connect directly to our customers. So the DVD business for Netflix looked like this. Every once in a while, you would say, I'm going to pick up some DVDs. Maybe on every Sunday night, you'd say, these are the DVDs I'm going to watch next week. And you'd put your DVDs in the mail, and new ones would come next week. And next weekend, you'd actually get around to watching some of them. And then you'd do it again. So the interactions were roughly once a week, a little bit of browsing. So we had a system set up to support this. And we had a decent-sized machines and whatever. But it wasn't really huge. Then if you look at the streaming business, people start binge watching you know, a whole TV series in a day, and then they'll watch another one, then they'll watch another one. And the system isn't just doing picking them, it's logging the data. It's giving you cost quality of services being monitored continuously. There's a progress heartbeat, so if you stop halfway through something, they know where you are when you resume. There's a huge amount of traffic going into the system compared to the DVD side, right? So what we found, if we just pick up, make some up some numbers, it's about 100 times more views per week. It's maybe, a hundred, maybe a hundred, sorry, 10 times the views per week and 100 times the um, number of requests per view. Even if you just take those, those are pretty conservative estimates. That means it's 1,000 times more traffic for every customer that stops using DVDs and starts streaming. Right? So as Netflix shifted from a DVD shipping company to a streaming company, this is what happened. That's our DVD capacity. That's our streaming capacity. The point where we were spending half our capacity servicing streaming was when one-tenth of a percent of our customers had started using the new capabilities. Right? That was when we had 50-50 in our front-end web services and API services, when we'd hit a tenth of a percent. So we're this is why we were going, uh, we have a problem. <laughs> we're going to be the new next Twitter fail whale you know, internet meme, and we needed to figure out how to deal with this. So that gave us a choice. Either recruit world-class data center operations people, guess the capacity we'd need, and build a huge data center, and put a huge amount of money up front into building that data center infrastructure. We're talking tens to hundreds of millions of dollars sized data center investment here. Or use AWS, where we could pay for it the month after we used it, and put that hundreds of millions of dollars into content that made the product better. And that's the choice, right? And obviously, the choice they made was, hey, let's go buy another season of House of Cards or, instead of building a data center. You know, one of those makes your costs slightly lower, perhaps, if you do it exactly right. And the other one moves the business forward. But that's the choice. And that's the big choice that lots of people are making now as they decide they shouldn't be spending time building data centers. So in 2009, I wanted to mitigate some risks. First of all, understand how AWS and Prime were related, and th they were separated. There was a, a phone call between you know, Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, and Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, to just, what's this AWS thing, and is it really separate, and they're not going to feed all our data into Prime and all that kind of stuff. They got comfortable on that. 
And then ever since then, Netflix has been used as the example by AWS of, yes, you can run your competing business on AWS and it's, it's fine and Netflix does it and other people do it and you shouldn't worry about it. The way Netflix used, thought about it was that we were going to use the strength of our biggest competitor against them. It's like a jujitsu move, right? You tip over, you use, use the weight of your opponent to make them fall over. So we, Netflix, it turns out, used AWS better than Prime ever did <laughs> to, to compete with Prime. Um, we did a whole lot of capacity experiments. One time we went, I wonder what happens if you ask for 4,000 machines at once? Well, get an autoscaler, said 4,000 instead of, you know, for that we'd only tried 100 or so at a time. And about an hour later, 4,000 machines were running, so that was good. Now, this is in 2009, it's much easier to do that now. But at the time, that was transformational. The idea you could create 4,000 machines in an hour just, just by asking for it was crazy. We signed up for an enterprise license agreement because you don't want to be running a, a major business on a click-through license and a credit card, it turns out. And this was, before, this was the first time AWS actually had an enterprise license agreement. It was sort of created by the first few big customers going, hey guys, uh, no, nah, we're not doing this on a credit card and a click-through. And we did this publicity story um, in the New York Times that was kind of the launch. The results of the this, this story were people thought we were crazy at the time. There's no way we, we were ever going to make this work. That was the prevailing opinion. First thing we did, try out some things that were not customer facing, that were not critical. We were coding movies and we didn't have enough capacity. So we moved it to EC2. That's where we grabbed these 4,000 machines to process this. It worked fine. And then once we processed them, we shut them down. And it costs the same amount to have 4,000 machines for one day as to have 1,000 machines for four days or 100 machines for 40 days. We had 100 machines before and our backlog was a month. So we shrunk it to a day by just having 4,000 machines. See? The, finally, the next thing was all of these streaming services were logging back into the system and our database that was handling the logging of the quality of service just got overrun by all the streaming capacity. So we moved it to S3, which is a really unlimited storage space. We, just, just to give you a reference point more recently, we just ran a benchmark where we created an exabyte sized bucket in S3 just to run a benchmark, an exabyte. That's a billion gigabytes or a million terabytes, right? Okay, just the, f we, go, we can talk about the, the actual thing itself, but the fact that we had a spare exabyte just to run a benchmark tells you that this is quite large. And some of you might have an exabyte and we have customers with exabytes, but it's, a lot, it's quite big now. 2009, it probably wasn't quite this big, but it's huge. So unlimited space and we moved log analysis and we used Hadoop to process this. This is in 2009 using the EMR. This was one of the first times where we said to Amazon, you've got the wrong version of Hadoop and you, we need this Hive thing and we need these feature set. And they went, okay, we'll build it up to the versions you wanted. And then we said, if you do that, we'll use it. So we kind of, they, they built the version based on our feedback to make it a usable stack of things to solve our problem and then Netflix has used it ever since. So that's part of the feedback loop, and we do that with our customers all the time. We say, well, really, we'd like this thing and these features, and we go, okay. We talk to a few more customers, pull it in, and that, that customer obsession, that's what AWS runs on, and that's why there are so many products coming out from us. So, start of 2010, we decided not to build any more data center capacity, so we had to move to the data center by the end of 2010 to survive. So we kind of went through and we kept converting front ends out, move front ends out to the cloud and by the end we had our back ends had grown to fill all the space that was created by moving the front ends out and our front end was huge. While we were doing this, we had this nice slide that we showed internally. It's like we really have a deadline on this because we are not going to build another data center. And um, Netflix, you get a choice. You either go to fly in the cloud or you're going to hit those trees at the end of the runway. There's a limited runway problem. We knew there's a big increase in capacity need to get through the end of the year, and we weren't going to build it out in the data center, so we had to move to cloud. So this forced March conversion was one of the key things that made it get done, right? It's another thing I see when people are doing cloud migrations. You set a real goal target. You, this data center is being closed here. It's out of lease. It's being shut down. You've got a hard, hard stop. Those kinds of things are what get these transitions to happen. We start off with the simplest possible API service, then the simplest web page, and then just APIs and pages one by one. 
And we did it by just doing redirects. So you'd hit the old, when the, the, hit the data center, and it would choose whether that page existed in the cloud and whether you were in the right test cells and things and what percentage of the customers we wanted to send there and just redirect traffic. So it's just redirects, HTTP redirects, and that worked fine. Um, eventually, we had to move data, so we start copying some data back and forth. And nowadays, um, we have some tools called Database Migration Service, which will actually continuously copy data out of things like Oracle or Teradata or MySQL um, Server, proprietary databases in particular, and you can use them to migrate to cloud. And you can move them to Postgres or MySQL or DynamoDB. Now, in 2011, we decided, OK, we're going to shut down the data center as the system of record and move to the cloud as the source of, as the the primary data source, so we needed Peter to back it up. And we wanted to replace our off-site tape backup, so we created a separate account in a separate region. And that became a very secure, durable way of doing this. And we set it up so it couldn't be deleted. It was automatic purging. And we, nowadays, there's long-term archive using Glacier. So we replaced this off-site tape backup with you know, put it in another region in another uh, account. Do you want to be guard against account takeover and a whole bunch of other internal sort of employee, disgruntled employee kind of things? You want to make sure your backups are really impregnable. But this is the replaces tape backup as a, as a mechanism. Finally, all in, they closed down the last data center. This happened after several years. Corporate IT moved, billing moved, um, stuff like that. And now everything is running on the cloud. So that's the migration. It takes a while. There's this last time. The tidying up the last few things takes a bit. So if we're moving databases, we start with these monolithic databases. Let's dig in a bit on this. And then the trouble is that databases, if you've been running them for a while, turn to this kitchen sink of all the schemas and all the tables and all the junk and all the queries that sort of, I, I have a table. I need to go somewhere. Well, I, well, we have a database, so I'll put it there. Well, I'm supposed to normalize that into everything, so it ends up tangled in, even if it shouldn't really have been based in, you know, if, even if the workload really had nothing to do with that. And what we really want to do is move to something which has a larger number of simpler databases, more NoSQL, more clean, simple relational databases that are on a sim single uh, conceptual thing, sort of the microservice front end for back end kind of model. You want to build a bunch of back ends that are single purpose. So you've got your monolith. It's a bit complicated. It's hard to run. You've got a monolithic database. And it's got a schema in it. And after a while, it gets more complicated. And it gets more complicated. And after, at the t time we hit this at Netflix, we'd been modifying the schema every two weeks for about eight years. And it was, became unmodifiable. <laughs> right? There was just bits of PL SQL and Oracle sort of oozing out of the seams of this thing. And it just became something that no one wanted to touch anymore. And it was slowing down the business. So we had to do something about it. So here's my analogy. There's your kitchen sink. Think of this as sort of a student dorm room kind of thing. There's some flies floating around it. Some of that stuff's been in there for months. right? <laughs> so there's your kitchen sink. What we want to do is clean it up a bit. So we're going to have a few other places to put things. We're going to pull out all the forks and knives and spoons and things, trying not to cut ourselves on the sharp knives and uh, cut ourselves on the broken glass. And, uh, and there's all these broken plates and stuff. So we're just going to give something a place to live where it should be and tidy the thing up. right? Now, this causes a new problem. Turns out. We don't have, we're missing a spoon, right? <laughs> so you've got to, you have to now figure out distributed consistency across data stores, right? It's not the end of the world. It's possible to do. It turns out this is an easier problem to solve than the problem of actually modifying a huge consistent database, right? So you're swapping a problem that's difficult for a problem that's less difficult. It's still a problem, but it's a more solvable, more tractable problem in many cases. And there's a number of different techniques you have to learn when your developers are being weaned off the, yes, you can use transactions and joins and all these things, to the, no, sorry, the data's in five different databases, so you can't use a join, and you can't transact across them. You have to do some application-level work to tie it all together. And there's a number of patterns for doing that, which we could get into, but I don't have time today. So. We're going to fix this, and we're, we got that. Oh, 
Next thing we're going to do is add a new use case. And the right thing to do here is not to put it in the same database. It's to create another database to put it in. Right? Don't keep adding stuff in. Make it really easy to create a new database for each new use case. So what does that look like? It's easy when you've got one of these big complicated systems to just add more things around the edge because with DynamoDB or RDS or in the cloud, you can create a new database with an API call in a few minutes or even seconds. You've created a new database, a new place to put things. So use that capability to make sure you're not tangling things together that shouldn't be there. And DMS, this database migration service, will help you untangle things and, and migrate things to open source databases. So we can untangle the schemas. We can keep working until we've got the system in a state where each data store has just the things it should have for basically a single microservices worth of, of, con of conceptual, you know, whatever. You know, the bounded context should be, here's the data store. Here's the piece of business logic that implements this business service. So that's what we're trying to get to. So, Gone through this, so let's think about what we're doing at the data, above the data, though. The business logic starts off as a monolith. Now, we've untangled our data tier. We're going to untangle the top. So we're going to figure out how the monolith has moved to microservices and why this happened, and then look at what's happening today as we move to functions. So years ago, we had monoliths. And the reason we had monoliths that was the best thing you could build, because we had one gigabit networks and slow CPUs, and we were serializing things with XML and SOAP, and that takes forever to deserialize and serialize. So you could only send a few messages a second. If you have a second to respond to a web request or an API call, it's going to take you too long if, you have, if you're using SOAP XML, slow networks, and slow, um, slow encoding mechanisms. But that was 10 years ago. We've got better systems now. So what happened when we moved to cloud like five years ago, we started using JSON. We have 10 gigabit networks. We have much more efficient encoding systems, JSON or you know, simple binary encoding if you want to go for the fastest thing out there. But what that gives you is the ability to break things into smaller chunks because the overhead of doing it was now orders of magnitude less. So you could have, instead of having two or three monoliths cooperating on something, you could have hundreds of microservices and still respond in that one second or whatever your, pay, whatever your response time wanted to be. So other than the very, very lowest latency requirement systems, we were able to build microservices-based systems because everything sped up to the point. So the ideas around... Uh, service-oriented architecture haven't changed. The implementation got efficient enough that we could build it to have a single function service instead of having a, a more a higher level thing with lots and lots of bits and pieces in it. So we're able to build this. We're able to fire off all of these different things and build much more complicated systems where this on the left-hand side is an, is an internet endpoint, and on the right-hand side, you've got a whole bunch of... Um, Data, data stores or caches or something like that. And you're just sending traffic back and forth. So that was five years ago. But it turns out that the services around the edge just became common services. They were open source packages, or they were things that we uh, built ourselves in the old days, but just turned into an off-the-shelf service. You know, something like SQS for queuing, or DynamoDB, or SNS for, net, for notifications or S3 for an object store. So a whole bunch of the things that we used to build that used to be parts of our monolith have now become off-the-shelf services. And our business logic is now sitting in the middle as glue between these building bricks. And this business logic is actually going through another revolution now as we simplify that into individual functions. So those functions, we've been able to split up the business logic and turn each one into a different Lambda function. But the cool thing we were able to do with AWS Lambda in particular was make them all completely ephemeral. So I've grayed everything out here. There's actually nothing running because I didn't give it any work to do. I've, I've defined my application. I've defined the functions, but there's no work here. And every time a request comes in, the Lambda functions come into existence just for long enough to run that code, and then they shut down again. You get charged for every 100 milliseconds that they run. So. When the system's idle, it costs nothing to run. So this is for a large number of workloads that are relatively spiky, particularly corporate IT workloads are a great example of this, because 
people, they work on the speed at which, you know, it depends how many employees are at work at any point in time, or they're spiking off businesses, or anything driven by, say, a TV ad where you want to respond to uh, people hitting a, a web page that, that's in a TV ad. Those kinds of spiky workloads are perfect for this. There's certainly cases where you've got a constant stream of traffic where you'd want to just build a service to process it. But there's a, a large class of applications where your systems are idle most of the time because they are just waiting for the next spike in traffic to turn up. And these systems are always 100% utilized. So that's the cost of running it side. And that's one reason why serverless is interesting. The other one is the cost, of, the time it takes to build these applications is incredibly short because you're just gluing together the building blocks. You're building the API logic that ties it together. And that is very quick. I, if you go to a hack day, almost every hack day I've been to recently, people are building serverless apps with Lambda because they can build so much in one day with that that they're just way ahead of if you're handcrafting your application any other way. It's, it's ridiculously, I, I was just staggered when I was seeing what people were building in sort of a single hack day concentrated effort. You can build incredibly large, scalable, complex systems by just assembling all these components now. So we've seen how business logic has evolved. Um, I'm now going to talk on a little bit about the things where we're going next and the things I'm currently working on. So I'm spending quite a bit of time thinking about serverless and where we're going there. But my new role at AWS, I, I'm responsible for a few things, as well as the sort of my, the strategy of where we go next. But um, particularly open source, so I'm going to talk a bit about that and the Apache MXNet project, which is a machine learning, deep learning system. So we'll talk a bit about these different areas, and I'll tell you about my, my self-driving car that I've built myself at the end. Well, it's a little less impressive than it sounds. Um, it's kind of fun. These are some of the projects that we contribute to. Um, basically, all of the Apache Hadoop ecosystem, we're contributing continuously, multiple updates per week. We run, when you use EMR, you're typically running a build that's one or two weeks past you know, old, right? If you take the current state of, our, of Hadoop patches and bugs and fixes, we're a very up-to-date, uh, automatically updated uh, version. And there's a whole bunch of other work going on. Uh, we contribute to Linux. We're members of the Linux Foundation. The Zen Hypervisor, there's contributions there. Um, Postgres. We've recently built an accelerated Postgres system. We also contribute to the Postgres project by giving them uh, free AWS resources to do all their testing. So there's a number of people we do that for. Um, contributions to Docker and other things. All right. Then there's the repos that we build, that we put out there that are you know, AWS code. And there's a few of these blocks as a container one. Um, remember when OpenSSL had all those bugs in it? We got, we got kind of annoyed by that. And somebody said, I can do a better job writing it again from scratch. So that's what S2N is. S3, when you use S3 in a secure mode, TLS, HTTPS access, you are going through S2N. So it is a clean room, verified, uh, secure replacement for OpenSSL that you can go and use for your services if you want to be uh, more highly secure and isolate yourselves from the next OpenSSL bug when it comes along. Um, the most recent one, and this came out earlier this week, is Sockeye. It's a neural machine translation library, sys framework built on top of MXNet. So if, you want, if you're playing around with machine translation, this is an open source framework for doing that. Quite powerful. They're getting some quite good results already. It comes out of uh, one of our, the AWS offices in Germany. Um, they've put it out there as open source. So you can go look for Sockeye on the... Um, AWS repos worth taking a look at. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about, more about MXNet later. A whole bunch of other stuff here. Some of the, oh, that actually, Sockeye comes from the Amazon uh, retail side, not from the AWS side. It's uh, related more to what they're doing with things like Alexa, I guess. And then there's all of those open source projects that are a pain to run that we just make it easy for you. So since 2009, I've, I've never had a problem installing Hadoop. <laughs> just make an API call and a cluster appears. <laughs> you have to install it. That was crazy. So Elasticash, MySQL, Postgres, all of these things that we're just making it easy to use. And this comes from customers saying, 
we're, we're, it's annoying that we have to go build this thing. Can you just make it easy for us to consume it? So we're always listening to customers about which open source packages we should just build as a service. And this, this database migration service I've mentioned a couple of times, 22,000 databases have been converted with that already. So let's look at deep learning. Why is this taking off now? Make sure I've still got time. Yeah. Everything's digital, and huge data sets are available. There's a huge amount of compute power available. So even though people were talking about deep learning applications 10 years ago, they didn't have the compute to do anything more than toy applications, and training took too long. Now you look at this Baidu Chinese speech recognition system, four terabytes of training data, and they're running 10 exaflops of processing power to have it recognize Chinese characters and, and Chinese speech. That's a huge amount of capacity. If you think about what the, now, there's, you know, overall, if you look at the capacity of cloud, what is it running? It's running a mixture of different things, right? But the people that are running deep learning are running a disproportionate amount of compute resource. Because when you go to train these systems, it's a, just a huge, you can spend as many machines as you can possibly get for weeks or months just training a system to get it better and better. At what we see in the future, if you just extrapolate this out, there'll be a point in time in a few years when you could think about the major workload on cloud, the dominant workload on cloud is training deep learning models. Right? That's why this is important. Right? That's why we're paying so much attention to this. This is probably the end game for what cloud is used for, what compute is used for in the world, is it's going to spend most of its time trying to learn stuff about what we're trying to you know, learn it based on all this data we're feeding it. And it's getting more and more affordable to do this. Think your training takes months, but the classifier that you get out of that training can happen in milliseconds or seconds. It's very quick. So it's a very asymmetric model. Once you've trained something, the classifier you can deploy on a Raspberry Pi or an iPhone or whatever, but the training model probably needs a back end. So that's why cloud is important. And this is the kind of stuff you're seeing. It's some autonomous driving examples. Um, these are in China somewhere, but you know you can just see it's tracking people, it's tracking cars. There's somebody walking across the road trying to kill themselves, but they seem to survive. Um, you know, this is this is kind of state of the art, and this is what's going on. If I live in the Bay Area, and there are cars driving around all the time with spinning things on top and doing all of that self-driving stuff, and we've seen them for years, but they're just becoming everywhere now. So people are starting to get used to them, and they're starting to get pretty good. So. What, what's AI, customers using AI today on, on, on AWS? A whole bunch of people here. I, I won't go through in great detail, but there's a lot of them. Uh, this is just a few. So what's the challenge? First of all, you've got petabytes of data. You've got to get that data into the system. You've got to train them on tons of GPUs. You want uh, elastic capacity. You want to, to give the, you want, you want to, it's the same thing as I mentioned with the, the batch processing, you'd rather have 100 GPUs for an hour than one GPU for 100 hours because you get your answer in an hour. <laughs> right? But it costs the same. Right? The area under the curve is the cost. So you just want to get the, the most scalable system that can scale to the largest fleet of GPUs that you can assemble, process that, then give it back, and then find out how good that is and crank it through the system. So that's why this is important. And uh, the actual prediction itself, um, we're starting to see GPUs used for that, but you can use it on pretty low-end systems at the edge and serverless. So we're deploying Lambda functions that contain trained models that have been trained using these weeks or months of CPU time. So this is the kind of stack. Um, a bunch of open source AI engines in the middle. Uh, Apache MXNet, I'll tell you about in a minute, but we have TensorFlow, Cafe, Torch, Theano, CNTK, Keras long line of these things. Um, they're mostly open source. At the bottom, you've got cloud hardware on demand. The P2 is a 16 GPU on a single machine that we can get. There's machines with a single GPU. There's elastic GPUs you can attach to machines. Uh, we have ECS for containers, Lambda. Greengrass is an IoT platform for deploying this stuff. And if you really want to get clever, you can design your own hardware and deploy it as an FPGA design on AWS now. And there are people working on that for deep learning as well. More coming. Uh, recently, NVIDIA announced their next generation GPU chip that's going to be out late this year. Um, 
AWS is the launch partner for that chip, so we get it first. That means you get it first through AWS, so we're going to be at volume first with that chip. Uh, that's the kind of, because our buying capacity, we can just go and do a deal like that. On top of that, there's an AI platform. Machine, AI, Amazon Machine Learning is a, um, just feed it some data and, and get predictions. It's useful for recommendation engines, and that's been out for a couple of years. We're doing more things in that area. That's platform layer stuff a bit easier. And on top, we have the easy to use services. Uh, if I took a photo of you right now and fed it to record, you say, crowd of people sitting in a room with lights, it, you know, it can tell what's in the scene. Polly, you give it some text and it says it in a lifelike way. Uh, Lex is the core of the Alexa service. You, you can build a chatbot with it with audio or text input. We built a call center around it, so you can use it for call center front end, th those kinds of core things. And there's more applications coming in that space. So we're just going to keep cranking out more and more and more use cases. The latest thing on recognition is we added celebrities. So you can show it a picture of Wonder Woman, and it tells you the name of the actress that's playing it. And I've forgotten her name, Gal something. She's I have to remember that. I'm, talk, I'm going to Israel next week, and I know she, I'll have to remember that name for them. Um, if you're getting into this, this is the easiest way you can uh, get in. There's a deep learning AMI, AMI. You basically have everything pre-installed. You fire up this image, and it's got all of the versions of Python you need, all the versions of all of the different libraries and toolkits. It's got pre-built drivers that know how to talk to the GPUs. We've been tuning it all. There's a team of people working nonstop on making this work reliably, testing it, and integrating it. Don't replicate this yourself. It's a total waste of time. You'll spend ages just trying to get the right version of Python installed for all of these different things. But we have all of this stuff built into it. So let's do a quick overview of MXNet. It's got a simpler syntax with lots, with very broad language support. One of the reasons that, that we decided to, to double down on MXNet was the language support. It's very portable. It's efficient. It works well on ARM chips, on uh, IoT devices. It's high performance. We figured of all of the things we tested, it has near linear scaling across hundreds of GPUs. That's the um, multiple machines, the multiple of our P2 machines all put together. We got great scalability on it and you know, pretty good scaling um, on, on hundreds of them. So that's very nice there. Um, Last January, it, we, it was proposed as an Apache project, and it's in the incubation process. So it's still working through. It's not fully you know, there yet, but it's working towards that, and the teams are, are going there. And we've been tuning it on AWS. So here's, here's what's going on. It's a pretty diverse community. Uh, about 35% of the contributions to MXNet come from people who currently work at, at AWS from at Amazon, but there's people, uh, this is, you kind of think of this as a university research team where people hired people out of those teams and those people are still contributing back, right? So Bing Su went to Apple, right? And somebody else went to, um, I don't know, MI, you know, Tesla or wherever. There are a number of places, or the Microsoft guy at the bottom, Nanzu. Th these people all went off in different directions, but they were, came out of the original research teams um, which were at UW and uh, CMU, I guess. So lots of different contributions here. And just some summary from the Apache incubation process. Uh, 51 authors with 165 commits. You know, there's a fairly large group of people here. It's a diverse group. We're trying to gather, we're trying to sort of push, gen you know, herd, cat herd, 150 contributors into, um, Oh, it's all these different people into the Apache process. So that's what takes time. This is going to take a few more months to get through. Um, one update recently, you may have heard of the Keras uh, front end, which is a easy to use front end on top of TensorFlow. Um, Francois Chalet is the guy that wrote that. He currently works at Google. But in Baden, we now have MXNet as a Keras backend. So you can still take all the things you wrote in Keras, and you can basically plug in MXNet instead of TensorFlow, and you can get access to um, any of the you know, performance, scalability things that we've been investing in on the MXNet side. So we're, it's early days. We're still figuring out some benchmarks to really show what the difference is. But it's coming up as a relatively portable, front, very high-level front end for building these networks. 
Um, some comparisons here. Um, we've decided to go with an Apache community uh, model here for governance. There's some interesting things with programmability that MXNet has an imperative mode. Most of the other systems are declarative. What that means is we have easy access from Perl, MATLAB, R in a when, when you're building a REPL and you're just typing something in and you want to try things out, you can actually do that with MXNet. It's harder to do that when you're building a network and feeding it through. And the code length, it's, it's concise. It's closer to Keras in its API than TensorFlow, which is quite verbose when you get into using it. And we found for some of the uh, workloads that we got a much smaller footprint, which makes it easier to uh, deploy on small devices. So here's the strategy. Integrate this with a whole bunch of services. Um, use it as a foundation for more things that we're doing and leverage this community um, and go you know, broaden the community to, to take it up. These are some of the things that Amazon's using MXNet for. Applied research, all of these different things. Um, somewhere it says machine translation. So that's that project that just came out as open source. Lots of different options here. If you think about everything that Amazon does in supply chain, logistics, robotics, all those things, plus all the stuff that's going on in AWS. So a quick look at the API. There's an ND array, very similar to um, the kind of thing that you'd use in um, NumPy. Um, a multi-dimensional array is also known as a tensor. This is where tensor and tensorflow comes from. It's a multi-dimensional array. And a symbol is how you create the expressions for the flows that you're going to pump this through. So you create a tree of processing steps uh, used by creating these symbols. And that's the flow part. So TensorFlow is basically just a, you know, combining together the, the, the description of the way these things work. So all of these things are basically TensorFlow type things. And MXNet is very similar to TensorFlow in the way it works, so that the API is a little different. So you can basically, this is, this is you know, what is this? One, you know, two times two or something. <laughs> but pros for this. Um, it's easy to do an imperative thing and in a debug what's going on because you can stop it. You can stop it step by step and see what's happening. It makes it easier to debug, but it's less efficient if you're trying to pump huge amounts of data through this. So it's better for data exploration. It's not as good for training and, and classifying. The more declarative model, you build this tree. This is the this is the flow part or the symbols and you compile this tree, and then you feed data into it, and the data flows through, and it becomes, it's very efficient because it knows which nodes you're no longer using, and it can collapse things and optimize it, and this is the structure that's then labeled out across, laid out across the GPU for high-performance uh, processing. But it's pretty hard to debug and figure out what's going wrong in the middle of something when you're pumping data through it. Here's the models. I'm almost done now, probably a lot of time here. Um, Bunch of different types of uh, inputs and outputs. Uh, this should be fairly familiar to most people. Fully connected convolutions, poolings, LSTMs along short-term memory. Those are used for mostly for tech understanding things like text. Um, and then there's this cool thing at the bottom. You try and explain this. Basically, if you're trying to understand language, you end up with a vector of weights for each word. And those, they represent the word, and it learns the weight. So once you've trained your language system, so somebody figured out that if you trained your system and it figured out what you, the, the, the vector that you had for queen was basically the same as the vector for king, if you subtracted out the vector for man and added the vector for woman. So it's like the system has figured out there's this idea of a regent, and there are male and female regents, and there are subclasses of it. So you can actually, there is some symbolic manipulation and, and basic understanding, but it's all done by the weights of these vectors of numbers. And these, this sort of conceptual understanding is actually what's going on inside these models. So that's what that's about. It's kind of weird. Why does it say Coles, King, Queen? Anyway, that's the story. Um, lots going on here. I'm just going to give you this little thing here. So this is my project. This is my self-driving car. It's about this big. It's a radio-controlled four-wheel drive truck thingy <laughs> with the radio unplugged and a Raspberry Pi jammed in the top of it. The software it runs is called Donkey. So I called my car Hote, so it can be Donkey Hote. And I'll show you it's an example of it engaging in Donkey Hote-like behavior. This is tilting at windmills. <laughs> Unfortunately, it, luckily, no damage was sustained to the other uh, truck. But um, yeah. So, 
it's a fairly weird thing. So this, this is an example of it, actually. I basically trained it to be scared of white lines, I think. <laughs> and it just goes, it's got the thing sticking out the top is a camera. And when it sees a white line, it goes, ah, and runs away from it. And this was trained on a different vehicle and on a different track. But even though the training was completely from, I think it got scared of the chairs at that point and ran away completely. Um, even though it was trained on a totally different environment, it still had basically figured out that it, was, it could figure out how to drive around a track. So we've, there's a team that meets, DIY Robocars is the name of the Twitter handle. There's groups starting up around the world. You could probably start one in Amsterdam if you guys want to do it. This is a great way to play around, to learn how to do this. It's all available. I, you know, this is a $200 US toy that I've built, and I've spent you know, five, $10 a month on you know, building this thing, running it. The way it works, there's an AWS instance, which is actually where you do your training that that's the, the car is connecting to, and then your phone connects to that instance, and you control it through the AWS instance. So it's powered through that. Um, all open source and uh, mostly written in Python, and it's a fun thing. I encourage you, go play with this yourself, play with your kids. This is where the world's going to be five, ten years' time. Understanding how these things work is going to be really important. At least having a conceptual understanding of what you can and can't do with them. So this is me trying to learn all that stuff. So this is my kind of last slide. I'm afraid a little out of time here. But um, lots of blog posts, um, lots of benchmarks. The slides, I'll, I'll give a PDF of the slides to the organizers, so it'll be up pretty quick so you can click through on these things. But, um, Jul Julian Simon, who's a AWS evangelist based in France, has done a whole series of blog posts on the MXNet API. Go follow him if you want to really be up to date. And Sunu Malia works on the MXNet team, sort of producing lots of blog posts like uh, some of these MXNet on Lambda kind of things. So that's that. Thank you very much.